Okay, good morning to everyone. Can I encourage you to please take your seats? Thank you very much. So we move now to the second session of this morning. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the program, the title of it is, and I read to you the title, is a new world economic order still conceivable in the foreseeable future? That's what we're going to discuss. <laughs> and before I get into the substance of it with our esteemed panelists here, I'd like to make two observations to get us started. The first is that, in fact, we've already been discussing this topic in the first session, because it's very hard today to discuss the economic outlook without talking about changes in the structure of international relations and the, what that means for economics. And we already got a few insights from that session, which will play into the conversation we have here. And the second point I want to make uh, before we start is that in a way, the question itself, is a new world economic order conceivable in the foreseeable future, begs another question, which is, is the current international economic order a stable one? In fact, you could argue that every year as we meet, the international economic order is already changing. It is already fraying. So the question is not whether we can conceive of a new world international economic order, but whether how we cope with the pressures and changes that are happening, sometimes in a not very orderly way. And perhaps we might be moving from an international economic order to a period of international economic disorder during which countries will conduct their relationships without the same set of rules that has governed those relationships for six, seven decades. And so those are kind of the questions that we would like to uh, get into today. And you've seen a very, we have six panelists and uh, each of them brings a, wealth of experience and, and insights into this. And rather than follow the order which is on your program, uh, I'd like to reverse it because that's part of the disorder in the world now. You know, we, should, <laughs> we should not imagine that things are happening according to the rules that we agreed a few uh, years ago. And so, if you permit me, I'd like to actually start off by asking Madame Touré, I mean, Madame Touré, who is uh, of course, the former Prime Minister of, of Senegal, and was on the same panel, uh, our, our discussion about some of the same issues at last year's World Policy Conference as well. So, Madam Premier Minister, I want to turn to you first, Aminata, and ask you, do you feel that the world economic order is, is stable, is changing? Do you have a vision of where it's going? How is it affecting the countries that, that you're most familiar with? Thank you very much. Let me uh, just say how uh, happy I am to be here. And uh, thank you for <clears throat> taking this going as a tradition. Well, you know, when you, when, when, you, when, when you age and you put on some weight, and you look at this very nice suit, because there, is, there are only men here, so I'm going to take the suit example. And you want to just fit into, into the one that you used to wear in your 30s. But that's what the world looked like. Um, you do have, you know, old powers that you used to dominate. Um, and they still want to keep things going. Because it's enjoyable to, you know, benefit from privileges. Uh, but in between, you have, um, you know, one part of the world that caught up or want to caught want to wanna catch up, uh, and then you move from what looks like a stable environment, but it was not for many people, 
coming from Africa, obviously, um, we want a new order, for, for sure. Um, and uh, you do also have within countries um, some groups that also want a new order that is more uh, equal, that is more human rights centered, um, that is more dignified for people. So you do have this tension uh, that is now being expressed uh, through different ways, um, not the most peaceful or the most positive ways, but definitely when you look into the 54 countries in Africa out of the 194, it's, it's quite a number. Uh, and what they would like to see is something different. They want to industrialize. Um, they want uh, to be more present. They want to see it at the Security Council. They've been <laughs> talking about it for so many years. So we do believe that um, a disorder is not that bad if you want to sort of be more present and you have your right more realized. So I think um, the disorder is called uh, by many peoples, including women. I mean, look at, the, look, at the, look at the room. Every year, that's the same story. <laughs> Black suits, um, older men, uh, not very diversified. Um, uh, wasp, as we said. I mean, let me just, that's the morning, but that's, that's the reality I'm facing, I'm seeing. So we want a new world, definitely, that is more gender equitable, <laughs> for sure. Um, how many women are leading countries? Very few, or prime ministers or ministers? Very, very few, regardless of the level of revenues or uh, industrialization stage, doesn't matter. This is an, a very old order. The, the, the boys' club, or the old boys' club, um, that is being very challenged. Um, right into, I mean, even in Africa, look at the, 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 the average of the population, the age. The medium age is 19. Well, it's 44 in Europe, by the way. Um, and they're nowhere to be seen. The elite is six-year-old plus. These are the ministers, the presidents, of course, and uh, um, well, they benefit from everything. But they're only 3% of the population. So these young people and these women want a disorder, and we want a reshuffle of the cards. Um, so it is expressed, as I said, disorderly. Um, not, they don't have you know, the, the chance of sitting where I'm sitting and saying it, but it's, 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 it's really something that we need to look into if we want to move to a, a new stage that is on. Economically, of, obviously, um, you do have you know, Africa, I can take Senegal, we do have a very old relationship with, with France. But how is it now that France is being you know, phased out, um, you know, in many countries. Um, you, you, if you follow the economy, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, Niger being the case in point. So what didn't go right for that to happen for such a long relationship? Well, what didn't happen is, you know, the, the, the hope for development didn't happen. So why would you entertain a relationship? It's like a battle a wife <laughs> in a couple somehow. Um, if you're unhappy, why would you keep that going? Um, are you going to replace it by something new that will be better? It remains to be seen, obviously. But when you have new partners and new players in the economic field, I'm talking about the Brazil, the Chinas, and the whoever is uh, you know, there, well, you attempt to look in another way. So in a nutshell, definitely what we would like to see um, do we have to go through disorder? It looks like it, and we are in the middle of it. Uh, by the way, when you talk about change, most of the time it's because it's, it, it's already happened. Um, so what we need to see is more equality, more justice, um, more representation of women, uh, young people being there, uh, more uh, race diverse, that, that, that's also uh, an issue, uh, that we really need to, to, to look into the new world we want to build, through uh, what we are doing now, discussing, but discussing very honestly and putting, having the courage to put issue on the table. We right. are unhappy with the states of international affair. That's what it is. And how are we going together to work together and make sure that we do have the dresses and the suits uh, that fits everybody and everybody's happy with? So that's uh, my, my first take on the issue. Thank, thank, thank you very much.
uh, I mean, I, I think for for raising sort of not just what people are unhappy about, but also some of the attributes of what people would like to see in in a new uh, international order. I think we'll come back in the second round to ask you whether you see us moving in that direction. What are the forces that will get us there? So if you were to look five years out or 10 years out, are we moving closer to that vision or are we basically uh, staying in, in, in a set of relationships that lead to all these, uh, not just resentments, but I think also increasing anger, I think, in, in many parts. Um, let, let me turn to uh, Chao Yi then, please, next and ask you, from where you sit, how do you see the pressures on the uh, current international economic order, and, and where do you think this is leading us? Okay. Before um, talking about new uh, economic uh, order, I guess we start to look at the uh, current or existing uh, international economic order from different uh, perspectives. Uh, for example, we can look at uh, the power pattern, uh, which is unipolar or multipolar. We can see the institution uh, uh, for current uh, international economic order. We have uh, we call Britain World uh, Institution, the WTO, IMF, World Bank. Also, we can see law and uh, regulation. Uh, objective, uh, which is global or domestic uh, priority. So from this perspective, we can see current uh, order still there, but at the same time, we have already seen sign uh, of change or decoping uh, happen. Uh, uh, very interesting, according to uh, WTO, they find uh, uh, in the IMF, IMF uh, annual report, uh, World Economic uh, Outlook, they count the fragmentation, this word, mentioning 172 times in this version, this year, while five years fragmentation only mentioned once. That's very interesting phenomena. Also, uh, we can see, uh, according to WTO, uh, they feel middle products uh, play a very important role in supply chain. But uh, you can see the share of mid uh, products among the total trade have already, uh, the share have already down from 51% uh, uh, average previous year down to 48.5% in first half of this year. So all this happened, I guess, uh, we can summarize two reasons. One is the internal fact in economic order, which I mean is the economic uh, pattern or weight have already changed. Uh, as mentioned, people mentioned in terms of PPP, uh, BRIC country share have already exceed uh, that of G7. Also, another factor is the external factor, like a ge geopolitical tension, a US-China conflict, and a war. Uh, so after that, I can imagine or think uh, there are four possible scenarios for evolution of international economic order. Uh, first scenario, I will summarize as a business as usual. Uh, that means G7 with US uh, as, a, as its head, still dominant uh, uh, Britain world institution. Second scenario is uh, the economic order get some improvement, uh, but at the same time is some kind of uh, Backward is I can call is a mixture. That's second uh, scenario. <coughs> the third scenario is uh, we can say is uh, 
substantial new order. Uh, developing countries have a more uh, right to say in uh, Britain world uh, institutions. Uh, uh, in international law and uh, regulation are more equal to uh, new developing countries. The last scenario, fourth scenario, is I can say is a totally disorder, is a totally fragmentation. Uh, uh, maybe there's a, a parallel uh, group, uh, uh, group occur, for example, like US and the G7, vice China and the BRICS countries. Uh, that way, I guess the scenario uh, scenario second, scenario three are more likely to happen. The scenario one and the scenario four less likely uh, occur. But the last one I don't totally not exclude it, but it will be last if the world uh, totally fragmented. Uh, uh, I just stop here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it, I think it's so you framed quite nicely four scenarios, sort of two extreme ends, and then two in the middle, one's a bit better than the other, and, and probabilities are we'll end up somewhere in the middle rather than at either end, but you don't want to exclude the, the worst case uh, from a fragmentation point of view. And I'd be interested to see whether the other panelists share that perspective in terms of whether the framing, but, but more importantly, where we are likely to end up. So le let me turn now to Jaime and uh, I mean, you had long, long experience in, in international economic relations, but also particularly in trade, and, and it'd be good to get your take on this. Merci, uh, Salam Masoud. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous ce matin. Uh, je voudrais tout d'abord uh, tenir à remercier Thierry de son invitation et féliciter son équipe de mettre en place cette euh, conférence magnifique. In order to talk about the new international economic order, I think uh, we need to identify the challenges we are currently facing. In this sense, I'd like to highlight two most significant challenges focusing on trade. First is the breakdown of international cooperation system at the same time, the collapse of the rule-based trading system. Edward Roos, Financial Times columnist, recently said that the rule of no, world trade is the rule of jungle. I, I think he's quite right, because the existing WTO rules are no longer respected, and new rules cannot be produced. With the declaration of Janet Yellen, U.S. Treasury Secretary, in April last year, that U.S. would pursue secure but free trade, sec free but secure trade with French shoring, the WTO's fundamental principle of MFN is that. And as you know, the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism continues to remain paralyzed with the non-functioning of its appellate body. More seriously, new international rules cannot be agreed upon, even though we need new rules on digital and climate change because the global cooperation system is broken down due to the intensifying US-China conflict and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. G20 summit of last year and this year clearly demonstrated that the G20 has lost its role as the World Crisis Management Committee with the breakdown of global cooperation mechanism. The G20, in addition to stabilizing the world economy after the 2008 financial crisis, was very instrumental. I noticed it, I witnessed it as a G20 chef of Korea in concluding the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2015 at COP21 and is early entering into force in 2016. However, 
In view of the current international political situation, it would be very unlikely that G20 can do anything meaningful regarding global issues such as climate, digital, health, energy, or food crisis. Um, because of the impossibility of producing a consensus on global issues, we can see the recent trend of fragmentation of the international rules on climate change and digital economy in particular. In fact, it would be, it would be more appropriate to say that European Union is monopolizing the legislation on those issues through GDPR, EU taxonomy, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act. Those EU rules are to be applied beyond the European Union. The good example is X, the former Twitter, can be subject to EU sanctions because of its misinformation and harmful content based on EU Digital Service Act and EU's recent decision to ban misleading carbon neutral claims will be applied to Apple Watches as well. With the launch of Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, United States is also trying to make new international rules, but it is not so certain. Because the, there are too many different economies participation in these discussions, and the issues are so difficult to be resolved. Moreover, the recently published draft text of Pillar 2, Supply Chain, I think is the most important, important pillar of the IPF, is very disappointing and far from establishing binding rules. And we can see the proliferation of national security exception invocation by major economies and increasing export control based on these national security exceptions. Since the government cannot produce the rules, we can see more active roles played by the private sectors and NGOs. Renewable 100 is an initiative by NGO, an international sustainable standard board, not the government, is producing a global standard for ESG disclosure of the companies. Second challenge is the strengthened government intervention in the economy. Deglobalization since the financial crisis of 2008 and COVID-19 have significantly strengthened government regulations. And climate change and digitalization of global economy requires stronger government intervention as we need new rules on these issues. The direct, direct impact of the strength in government intervention is to increase subsidies by the major economies to the detriment of the middle power countries. The US, European Union, Japan are currently trying to offer subsidies to their own industries, most notably in semiconductors and electric battery in order to combat China state capitalism. I think the problem of the subsidy is, is distort trade and industry because government decisions, not market forces, determine competitive outcomes, thereby substantially reducing efficiency. We can see the invisible hand of the market is giving way to the visible hand of the state. I stop here and come back later about how to properly address these challenges. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jaime. We'll, we'll come back to that because there, you could have a parallel conversation where people would say, look, we have to achieve a set of goals, whether they're security, whether they're climate change or global public goods, and, and we have to use a set of instruments that we have, policy instruments. Some of them are subsidies. We talk a bit with Pierre comes next, and you know, if you take the European version, it's a bit less subsidies, a bit more regulation. And, and if this has a consequence in terms of influencing the pattern of trade flows, 
that's a price once you just have to pay. And I think the question that we'll have to pose is, how does one address that trade-off? Because we're no longer going to be in a world, in my view, where we can only sit on one end or the other of the spectrum, you know, and, and the danger in some ways is that there are two parallel conversations going on, one about the sort of what we frame as, as a liberal economic order and one about a whole set of new uh, issues that are on the table that people want to address at the national and international level, but I'm not sure that those conversations are coming together enough and, and it would be interesting to get your view and of the role of middle powers in, in advancing that. Pierre, you've listened to three of your fellow panelists and, and you have a set of views on this, so it would be interesting to get those. Thank you. Um, and thanks to, 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 to Thierry for inviting me in this uh, major conference. Uh, let me uh, reflect a little on uh, the notion of uh, international economic order. Um, and the first question is whether we need one. And as an economist, my answer would be yes, because we believe in markets, and markets don't function in a vacuum. They, they, they need rules, they need previsibility. And an order brings that. And the reason why we were so prosperous after World War II was because there was a set of rules of the game and market players could believe in them and, and use them. So in a way, we do need uh, a, 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 an order. My second remark is that an order is not going to be stable. It's a reflection of a current set of political issues concerns, challenges that needs to be solved collectively. And it's not likely to be um, to resist to changes in uh, the global environment. So in a way, there are cycles. And this is very well shown in a, in a major work by um, Mark Danton in the United States uh, about the, the history of the world government. Uh, in which he shows that there are cycles. And the cycles start with a loss of legitimacy of the existing order. And then there is an interregnum in which new ideas are discussed, there is disagreement, and that leads to a new order. And then again, the new order suffers from losses of legitimacy. And Danton says that uh, we are in the third uh, cycle. The first one was between the 1910s and the 1940s. And, it, and, and the interregnum lasted a long, long time. You may re recall the fact that the major international conference in London in 1933 was a, main, a major failure. And, uh, it, and, and the new order that emerged was the Bretton Woods Agreement. And then there was a loss of legitimacy at the end of the 1960s, the early 70s, with the rupture of the exchange rate agreements within Bretton Woods, with the uh, oil shocks. And the interregnum lasted till the end of the 1970s with the emergence of the neoliberal order with Margaret Thatcher's uh, Reagan uh, and the deregulation of uh, uh, financial markets. So, this neoliberal order again suffered from a loss of legitimacy that maybe we can date basically with the, the uh, 2008 uh, crisis. But this loss of legitimacy is now what creates the interregnum disorder we live in. And it's very complex because it is multiform. One is inequality, the fact that financialization failed to deliver prosperity for all it benefited mainly, mainly the rich. The second is the failure to deal with the major environmental challenge. Not only climate change, but climate change and biodiversity. The third is the vulnerability created by very tight supply chains. And we again live through that during the COVID uh, pandemics. The fourth is the political incompleteness of that order. It is increasingly difficult to explain to major emerging countries that the governance of the world is mainly directed by the older powers. It doesn't work. The fifth is horizontal incompleteness. We have worked a lot on trade, but how about labor rights? 
How about the environment? How about health? When you look at the structure of the world institutions, WTO was a more powerful institution than ILO. Is that legitimate? Well, increasingly, the legitimacy, the loss of legitimacy, hinges on the fact that we have not been able to work as successfully on other aspects of interdependence. So that's where we are uh, now. Politics come back, and this is a good news. We need to work on these challenges. The big question is how long will it take to reach a, a set of negotiated agreements that reconcile the national interest with international collaboration? And this is what an, an international order is about. It could be a definition of an order. I think for a number of years we are bound to muddle through, which may not be a catastrophe, but it means that markets won't be anchored on a set of rules, so we may have less growth indeed. That may also be an opportunity to redefine what is the purpose of economics. Is it growth? Is it shared prosperity? And by the way, how do we define growth? Is it the change of GDP? We all know that it's a very, very poor indicator. So in a way, all this now has to be discussed. And I would interpret the disorder as a wonderful opportunity. But as the 1930s demonstrated, I'm not sure that we can manage this opportunity successfully. Thank you, Pierre. So you, you know, very, very uh, coherent and integrated a comprehensive set of issues that all need to be addressed. And I guess the question I'm going to come back to you with is, and actually to the other panelists, is you know, two thirds of the way through the first round, we've got a very good sense of all the problems and uh, also of all the things that need to be addressed. But we also have a sense that the current set of international political relationships makes it hard to address any of those problems well. And what I want to come back in the second round is to get your views on well, how are we going to actually make any progress on addressing these things. And if we don't make progress, in a way, how will we manage without the right set of rules still to have interactions? What, what's the consequence of all this? So I think it would be useful to see where, where is the impetus for change going to come. And it can't just be to preserve the past because of all the problems you've just outlined with the past. So uh, starting with Madame Touré, you know, so you started and then Pierre, your last set of comments shows this. Here's all these sets of problems with the way we currently manage our relationships. And we're sort of not clear how we can actually move those forward. So I think if you could have a, a if you could think a bit about that set of issues, we'll come back to that. But before we get there, I've still got two more colleagues to get their perspective. So Vladislav, now I want to turn to you, please. Vladislav Finozemtsev, uh, uh, from where you sit, how do you see this, this whole conversation? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was a very interesting question and a very interesting topic. Uh, and I reflected on this. I would say, first of all, that uh, to me, uh, the question of new order uh, seems to be more a question of a new framework because uh, the word order is, I think, too strong to, uh, for describing the current economic condition. So the frameworks for economic uh, cooperation, for economic competition, they have changed many times since uh, in the last 100 years. And so what I see these days uh, is that the globalization and you know what is called the end of history, the unification of the world, which was also cited by, uh, with, uh, by Mr. de Montreal uh, in our opening session, is a little bit exhausted uh, because no order can, I think, persist uh, without, uh, no order can be universal. And so the major, I would say, challenge for the globalization is its own globality because the world is too different, the many parts of it, it uh, they are too different from each other, uh, to be ruled and to be governed with uh, one set of rules. Uh, 
So therefore, I think that what we are seeing now is not so much uh, mul uh, the emergence of multipolarity and global competition between different centers of power, uh, but rather a new kind of regionalization inside a mostly globalized world. Uh, this uh, regionalization would uh, be managed by the major economic powers, for example, United States and Europe on the one hand, and China on the other hand, on the other hand, but it would not be so much political differences, but econ difference in economic models. So uh, it's not about, you know, Asian century or Pacific century against Atlantic century. It's more about, you know, information and post-industrial economy against uh, more traditional uh, commodity economy or industrial one. And uh, therefore, I would say that uh, United States and Europe will uh, major, uh, may, I would say, rely on the uh, innovative economy, on production of uh, sophisticated uh, and high-profile goods which actually underline uh, maybe not superiority, but so kind of self-expression of the people. So when you look on the United States these days, the most successful, com uh, successful company is uh, Tesla and SpaceX, which actually embodies innovation. If you look on Europe, the biggest uh, European company by capitalization is LVMH, uh, which actually uh, specializes on producing unique and specialized goods, uh, embodied, embodying creativity of the European people. So. Uh, my point here is that uh, Europe and the United States will produce an economic model which is based on, I would say, first of all, the sense of belonging to some, uh, you know, maybe golden billion or whatsoever, and on self-expression, uh, while China and most of Asia will pursue the economic model built on mass production of cheap and qu high quality goods, which would have a huge demand for them in, all, in, in many parts of the world, which are not so much, uh, not, not, so, uh, not so wealthy as uh, Europe or the United States. And therefore, uh, I think this model can coexist for a while, and they co can compete, uh, they can expand their sphere, the region of influences, uh, without uh, engaging in kind of political confrontation, which was very uh, obvious and very, uh, often seen in, in the 20th century. I would also point out that um, this uh, competition between, uh, I would say, information and post-industrial uh, countries and uh, resource-oriented economies and industrial economies uh, will uh, definitely result in much, uh, I would say, in many rounds of this competition, because uh, what we are talking about is a kind of catching up development and I would say that since 1930s, uh, there was no any change in uh, the first economy in the world. The United States led the world uh, for around 100 years. Before, it was very natural, you know, when France overtook Holland, when Britain overtook France, when Germany arrived as a huge industrial power, and then the United States came. But for the last 100 years, there were a lot of attempts to challenge this uh, hegemony, like by the Soviet Union in the 70s, by Japan in the 80s, and now by China. And so therefore, I wouldn't say that we are now approaching some new economic order, because uh, for this to happen, it should be a proof that some country can overtake the leader, which is, uh, you know, I would say the United States or uh, the Atlantic civilization. It's hard to believe that it can, can happen, because everyone, uh, if one remembers the end of the 80s, everybody says about the end of the Cold War, about the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but the economic shock in Japan was actually have, have, had happened at the same time. So in the, eight of, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the whole industrial system went into crisis, both in its Soviet version and its Japanese version. And this was the first step of new economic reality. So I would say, I, I would finalize that uh, I cannot see the new economic order emerging. I can see another, you know, circle of economic change uh, approaching. But this will not be a new order. This will be different 
frameworks, different models competing with each other. And uh, it's very nice to say that uh, these days economic issues and economic power right. is actually more significant than political and military one, uh, which is uh, quite contrary to what we have seen in the early 20th century. So hopefully this transition, whatever it might be, would be more peaceful and more complex than it was uh, before and during the First or the Second World War. Thank you very much. So you, you've got this vision of multiple coexisting frameworks that sort of govern relationships amongst groups of countries. And I think that will raise the question of whether countries will be forced to be part of one framework or the other, or whether they can be part of multiple frameworks at the same time, and mm -hmm. whether countries are willing and ready to be forced to take sides and join one framework or the other. And I think maybe when we come to Madame Touré, I mean, in a way, in Africa today, a big issue for many countries is that they're being asked to take sides and, and they don't want to. So how does one manage that as well? Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, Jan Paternum, I, I want to come to you last, please, for, for your thoughts. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Masoud. I think we can all uh, dream of a new economic order, but if we really want to build a um, new, vibrant, uh, multilateral organization, uh, we need to meet, in my view, two conditions, like frankly in any diplomatic negotiation. One is to define clear mutual benefits, right? And the second is to have strong, equal players. So let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, how do we achieve mutual benefits? I think we are part of the problem we are all facing is that in a way we are flying, <coughs> flying blind here. We, we, we frankly don't have much information to assess, for instance, how much damage countries, companies are inflicting on each other um, and on society as a whole. So in other words, we must do a better job at understanding and mitigating externalities, right? And what I mean by externality, because we've all used the word, but it's anything that disturbs the level playing field between individuals, companies, and countries, right? So let me give you two concrete examples of what I think are achievable goals uh, with hopefully enough consensus. One is to curb excessive concentration of corporate power pretty much everywhere in the world. We talked a lot about inequalities, but I think that's at the center of the problem. There are reasons to be optimistic. The OCD, OECD countries, as you know, have already achieved a minimum corporate tax. And I think the issue now is to tackle the issue of tax optimization and in particular transfer pricing mechanisms. Right. As you know, the uh, U.S. government is looking very seriously at the issue. Uh, Microsoft was uh, given a very significant fine just uh, a week ago or so. And, and I think, you know, to put things in perspective first, uh, you may know that, but, you know, it is estimated that $1 trillion of corporate profits each year are booked uh, in tax heavens, right? Uh, it's a considerable amount of money, and I think we need to do more on that front, and, and that, you know, again, governments should have mutual interest because that's more money for their coffers, right? And the second goal uh, I'd like to illustrate in the area of climate change is that, you know, First of all, you know, deglobalization it makes it harder to achieve our uh, decarbonization goals, not easier, right? So I think that, that's a very uh, strong point to make. And to illustrate this point, uh, someone talked about the uh, WTO report that was issued just last week. One interesting statistic is that they looked at solar panels, for instance, over the last 30 years or so. And, and as you know, there's been a huge decrease in cost. 
And the WTO economists were able to assess that 40% of that decline uh, was due to economies of scale uh, that were obtained through international free trade. So, you know, um, at the op in contrast, if we don't have this kind of economic efficiency, we are even less likely to meet our uh, decarbonization uh, targets, right? Um, so that's the first point around you know, m defining strong mutual interests and hopefully not too many of them uh, so that we don't get distracted. Again, it's like any uh, diplomatic exercise. Uh, the second point about having strong players, I think we talked about GDP this morning and <coughs> uh, how the, the picture looks scary for Europe. In reality, in terms of PPP uh, basis, so in, in plain English, uh, adjusted for cost of living, uh, GDP in Europe is only 4% lower than in the US, right? Uh, and, and actually, if you look per capita, Europe is actually in a better situation now than it was 20 years ago. So we have to put things in perspective. However, this is today and, and, and the past, going forward, uh, the situation is very weak for Europe, uh, which is missing essentially the technology uh, revolution. And just one statistic that is very revealing, uh, in Europe, private companies invest about $50 billion a year uh, in technology R&D. Uh, in the US, it's five times this amount, about $250 billion. And China, which started from zero 15 years ago, is now well above Europe. So, you know, with less uh, economic power, uh, the issue for Europe will be how relevant it can be on the international scene and still influence uh, the world. Uh, and, and then the second weak player for completely different reasons uh, will be emerging markets. And I think that that probably where we need to um, make collective decisions for the sort of long-term common uh, good, if you will. Thank you very much, Jan. So we have 37 minutes left. I want to make sure that we have some time for people sitting in the room to be able to raise questions. So what I'd like to do now, if it's possible, is really to ask each of you a question which I'd like, if it's possible, to answer it very quickly in two minutes, if you could. And I, the first question I have is for you, uh, Madame Touré, which is, you heard this vision of you know, multiple frameworks and, and coexisting. In some ways, you have some of that already. From your point of view, would that be a good outcome or would that be a bad outcome? Well, definitely. Uh, I've spent now some years in the multilateral organization. I was a former UN personnel for many years, went back to, I mean, went to government. And I came out of this process uh, thinking that you need frameworks for sure. You need many frameworks. Um, and I always speak from the, the point of view of Africa now. I mean, after having been global now, focusing on Africa, um, the richest continent, by the way, by any means, and the poorest. Um, so whatever framework that will deal with that issue, we're going to be part of it first. Um, second, um, I'm more interested, and I think that's the feeling in the continent that we have to take uh, business into our own hands. Um, how to strengthen African Union, how to make sure that we are self-interest driven because that's how the world works and we are going to be more uh, forward coming in terms of um, you know, defending our interest, um, being very strong on you know, whatever issues and making our own points. Um, I appreciate it when you uh, talk about you know, sort of forcing some countries to, to take part. That was the case for the Russia-Ukraine war and, you know, most of African countries look at it as a white man's war <laughs> somehow and uh, just didn't take it, you know, position and that's, that's how right, um, like everybody does. Um, but I think 
the questions that need to be um, uh, reflect upon is how are we going to make sure that we uh, move forward peacefully, uh, peacefully to a more equal order, an order that respects the environment, that put women also on an equal footage. Nobody brought the issue of, 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 of inequalities and, and, and making sure that young people are part of it. Um, and that we'll need um, for the corporations. I think that's, that's right. very important to bring uh, that upon. To look beyond profit, because we are a profit-driven um, world as we speak. So it's not enough anymore. So do we want to go through changes by revolution? Or do we want to be smarter and put in place you know, equal um, you know, frameworks where uh, true discussion comes out of, uh, of what, we, what we want to, uh, to build for the future. Every time I come in this country, in the Emirate, I remember that Dubai, 100 years ago, was a small Bedouin village. So how did change occur? It means that it's possible. Uh, it means that you can accelerate change. It, and then you can uh, have a more sane discussion. Because we are having an insane discussion right. because you do have a poll of very wealthy uh, group of countries in front of, of very poor countries. But within those countries, you do also have that huge gap. I was visiting south of Senegal in the mining areas just before I came. I mean, it, it was terrible. You do have like very big mining companies um, you know, taking gold out of the country. And they were not even capable of building a decent, um, you know, road. <laughs> because they don't care about it. They just have an airport. They can fly a private jet. Go. There. It looks like the world we are in. Um, so how are we going to, 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 to take a pause and then come back to what the United Nations was supposed to be as a promise um, and share the common interest as human beings? Other than that, I mean, people are, what I'm seeing now, uh, very much even into the, you know, within the intellectual elite, is let's focus on our own interests as the rest of the world is doing. Um, human rights, okay, we can talk about it very globally, but it's not a reality. Right. So that's how we, we, we look at it. So what are the solutions that we want to come up with um, that, is, that are human rights centered, that are equal, and preserve the environment? beyond just the idea of pursuing profit. Thank you very much. So, very clear message that you want to be clear about your own interests and engage in multiple conversations, multiple frameworks, but be clear about what is the, to the benefit of the, the continent and organize yourselves in a way to better represent those interests. And in that context, I assume that you, know, you and many uh, leaders in Africa would welcome the decision about making the African Union part a permanent member of the G20, because I think that in some ways is one forum where that could happen. Um, you know, I want to turn to you and ask you a question. You, know, you sort of said, you've heard this vision about the, your four different scenarios. To what extent is where you end up across those scenarios a function of the relationship between the US and China. How much is that going to drive where you end up? And what's your quick, quick response to that? Yeah, I guess the relation between US and China uh, probably is the, the one of the most important uh, relationship, um, which you will drive uh, uh, many things, including uh, uh, geopolitical tension. Uh, uh, although Euro, uh, European countries say to China, uh, don't lock us through US. When they visit US, US say, or they say to US government, don't lock us through China. But actually, the US-China relationship uh, now is kind of uh, pre- uh, very important law. The good news is in past several months, we can see the tension between US and China a little bit reduced. May not big improvement, the tension being reduced. I think that's good 
for US, for China, for the rest of the world. Uh, but at the same time, we should be sure, we should understand the, the policy uh, US government adopt to China call small yard hall fans wouldn't be changed. So competition wouldn't be changed, but the, 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 the tension has been reduced. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for being so clear about it. And of course, you have to see the, what is the mechanism by which the small yard stays small. <laughs> because the, the internal pressures in all countries will be to make the, the yard bigger <laughs> without worrying about the height of the fence. Uh, now, I, I want to turn to you, I mean, ask you a, a question, which is, let's assume there's some continuing improvement but in the US-China relationship, but still tension, and, and particularly when it comes to setting up global rules, to what extent can middle powers create a set of rules that govern relationships among them, even if the largest economies in the world are not so actively participating? And I'm thinking of dispute resolution in the WTO, where the formal process is frozen, but there is a parallel process that has been created by middle powers, which works to to basically govern disputes as if it was within the WTO, more or less. To what extent do you think that's a model that can be used in lots of different ways to, to govern, provide frameworks for, for the world? Um, thank you for your questions. In fact, uh, you, what you mentioned is ideal, but in reality, it cannot be applied. In fact, the U.S., European Union, and China, the only powers who make the regulations. Without them, it's not possible. You see, the, I participated in the Uruguay Lounge negotiation in the 80s, 90s. It was de facto bilateral negotiations between European community at the time and United States, despite more than 100 countries participated. But now, the landscape are totally changed totally changed, especially with the joining of China to the WTO in 2001. So I think it's uh, very important to persuade the middle powers the, the role, including Korea, Japan, if you say the European Union is a middle power, okay, the UK, Canada, and other countries to persuade both China and United States to participate in strengthening rule-based international order because the strengthening rule-based order is the only solution to their dispute. Without clear rules, they cannot make any settlement. So I think the middle powers must enhance their efforts to persuade China and U.S. respectively to honor the already established commitment and agree to the strengthening the rule-based order. Thank you very much. That, that's also very clear. So the middle power's role is not to create a framework that works for them, because from what you're saying, it doesn't work without getting the big China and US into it. But they can play a major role in helping to persuade. And, I, and I, I think that's quite relevant for a conversation we'll have later about climate change. You know, we're going to be having COP here in, in a few weeks. And, and the, is that the approach one has to follow also in COP? Uh, and, and Pierre, <coughs> I want to come to you with a question, which is you had a very long list of things that need to be fixed in the world order. And, we all have. <laughs> and, and everybody will add to it. You know, if, we, if we go around the room, we'll add another 20 other things. And yet, Khan's point about mutual interest. So, which of these lists on your list? What is, would you say, is the pillar on which we cannot make progress without international cooperation? And it is in our mutual interest 
to create a framework for operating them. And then there are other things where it would be nice to have cooperation, but the world will struggle along without cooperation. So what's your sort of priority list of things? Well, there are many ways to, to address that question. First, I, I, I'd be tempted to say that uh, whatever I think doesn't matter because what we need to do is reach a consensus. So for that to happen, we need to discuss with others. And I think the priority today is not to pick an issue and a solution. It is to meet and discuss and see where national interests are and how they can be combined to define a common good. But of course, as an analyst, I would attempt to answer differently and say there are major issues today that cannot be addressed without collective action. And certainly climate change is one. So it's, a, it, it's, it's going to be a mix of these two approaches. I think that we come to the negotiating tables with ideas, with convictions, but these convictions can reach nothing unless they are shared by others. So it's part of the negotiating process. And to negotiate, you need to understand and try to know more about the other parties. And that's why I think that more research, more knowledge is needed to understand our potential partners and allies better than we do, because we, we, we are working with stereotypes. And that is not going to, 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 make, uh, to, 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 to make the negotiation easier, easier. Now, there is a third way to address your question, which is to say that we cannot progress without a common vision. And, and I, I believe that's true. And I believe that part of the negotiation is to reach a common vision. The difficulty is that when you look at history, common mobilizing visions, shared visions, tend to come out during wars. So a big question today is whether I mean, it, it's what William J. James would have called in the early uh, uh, 20th century is the moral equivalent of war. Where is today the moral equivalent of war? Sustainable development goals? No. Climate change? Not even. The uh, net zero economics? Not mobilizing enough. So where is this project that can be mobilizing enough to create a shared vision? And I don't know, and that what I think makes me afraid, because if we need a major crisis of major proportions, much bigger than when we have experience, or a big war to reach that common vision, then I think that it is certainly not the preferred scenario. So I'll stop there, uh, because that, 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 that. it's not very optimistic, but <laughs> I, I believe that the pessimism of analysis can lead to the optimism of action, and I think that we need more multilateral discussions, and even when summits don't reach a conclusion, it doesn't mean that they are not useful or successful. Thank you very much, Pierre. So this is getting a little somber towards the end, but uh, let's have. So do, do, do you agree that we need common vision and understanding each other before we can actually reach the agreements on, on things that matter to us? And maybe quite hard to get to a common vision without more of a crisis. Um, do you think that it's possible to isolate one or two areas where we really need, in our mutual interest, without a common vision about the world and where it's going, still make progress? So how, how do you see this, this big vision, big bargain versus let's pick a few things? Mm. It's a, it a, it's a good question. But um, I would say that uh, listening to the discussion, uh, I reflected on the current situation in general, and I would say that, uh, to my mind, um, we now are in a situation when a lot of old and uh, fundamental processes are still evolving, and we don't see the end of these trends uh, close enough uh, to uh, realize whether we can uh, orchestrate a new order or not. So, first of all, uh, we have seen since the beginning of the 21st century uh, the intensification of uh, military conflicts uh, in many parts of the world. And in any case, uh, I would say no political goals were really met with uh, uh, armed interventions. Uh, the economic uh, effect was very devastating for many countries. 
uh, and uh, this new you know, circle of war, like uh, the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, we also contribute to the understanding that the military interventions and the military confrontation is ruinous for the contemporary world, and it just, uh, you know, um, destroys the economic wealth and doesn't, has, doesn't have any positive consequences, because in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, wars, uh, they deliver economic benefits for the, victory, uh, for the victors. Now it is not the case. Uh, so, and before this would be uh, really understood, I think uh, there is no little chance for new order to exist. The second point is that uh, every time uh, the, um, it was spoken about economic order and the new economic reality, uh, it was uh, when uh, the new economic trend emerged. For example, uh, in 1960s, 1970s, uh, the uh, resource production producing countries, they became, you know, very high flyer in economic uh, sense. Uh, and uh, the very concept of new international economic order was put forward in 1971. But 15 years later, all these countries were ruined by you know, the huge debts, uh, and they were bailed out by the United States and many other de uh, developed countries. Uh, the same situation was, uh, as I already mentioned, with the Soviet Union and Japan in 70s and 80s. They were also high flyers, and then a uh, huge uh, systemic crisis emerged. So now we have this competition between China and the rest of the world, and I think we should wait for another, I would say, 10 years to understand what the perspective for China is. If China uh, comes to the same uh, result as uh, Japan in 1989, by the end of this decade, it would be an absolutely different perspective for new economic right. order to emerge. And the last point, which uh, the colleague said very interesting, was the problem of taxation and the problem of uh, you know, uh, offshore safe havens. So uh, in this case, I would say that uh, this uh, tax system which exists uh, in, in the whole world these days uh, actually takes its, uh, it has its roots, uh, it takes its roots from the early 20th century. And uh, all the tax system was uh, designed for either mercantilistic economy, economy of trade, or for industrial economy, where, uh, you know, everything was reproducible and whatsoever. And uh, the stock market, uh, the capital gains were not so much Anticipated. Now, uh, the creative economy of post-industrial post world of informational technologies creates a lot of wealth, and this wealth creation is actually a major engine for economic growth and prosperity. If uh, we tax uh, personal incomes or capital gains as we do for uh, last decades, uh, it would stop economic growth in the most promising countries. So my point would be, so for you know, challenging this uh, offshore economy, some countries, wealthy countries, should switch from the taxing the incomes to taxing the consumption. And this may change immediately and generally the whole economic construction, uh, the whole economic uh, framework for the, for the world, because the first country that changes the system, uh, it will get enormous competitive advantages uh, upon all others. So I would say there are too many trends which are coming from, uh, from quite distant past, which are still dominating the global economic order, and many of them can evaporate and can be changed in, in coming decade or two. And so afterwards, I think the perspective for re recreating this economic order would be much more uh, realistic than they are now. Right. Now we are in a kind of a tunnel vision, and we cannot <coughs> jump out of it. Thank you. So. We should wait for a decade or so until things become <laughs> clear. And I guess my question to you, Jan, is can we afford to wait? No, I don't think we can afford to wait, but I want to clarify something about, you know, the idea of setting priorities. That's all good, but unfortunately, we can not lose track of the bigger picture. And uh, we, we need a holistic view so that, you know, uh, the impact of our decision is clearly uh, assessed so that uh, there are no unattended consequences. And if you take the example of the carbon tax, that's going to have an impact on a single mom right. struggling to raise a child and <clears throat> who needs her car to visit patients because she's a nurse. The sad truth is that today, governments don't have the ability 
to target specific, very specific uh, categories of population. You can do it in broad terms, but if you look at how much money we wasted during COVID or during the inflation uh, period at, at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, it, it tells you a, a story that, that is a bit sad. So we really need to raise our game in terms of pricing uh, externalities. I think right. that that's essential. And you know, one area uh, in particular, if you look at the work, the, the latest report for, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, there's a lot of debate on whether uh, new projects uh, in all fossil energy should be allowed. And you know, you see a lot of arguments from here and there. Uh, no consensus, and, and I think that's, again, a lack of fine-tuning or, or findings, and I think it's very important that NGOs in particular become more involved, uh, companies as well, to build right. uh, stronger data to uh, help governments uh, make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, of course, every politician that tries to price externalities uh, find that they run into immediate uh, political difficulties. And I guess the question for us is also going to be to what extent are the political systems in our countries, in, in particularly in the rich countries, capable now of taking the decisions both nationally and internationally that everyone here is saying are essential and, and I think to what extent is the roots of the international economic disorder actually in national economic uh, dysfunctionality and national political dysfunctionality in so many countries? Okay, I think we have time for, we have 13 minutes. I want to take two questions. And in the strictures from Madame Touré, I want to go to the, the people who are underrepresented on this panel, <laughs> which is young people. Uh, <laughs> And women. One over there. And, 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 and also... Uh, <laughs> Two thirds of men. humanity. <laughs> and please be precise and, and concise if you can. I will try. Uh, hello, my name is Basil Kotz. I work at the European Commission. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Um, you've mentioned that the global uh, economic uh, order is forever changing and is impacted by many factors. Uh, my argument is that, and you mentioned it as well, uh, it is impacted by the evolution of technology and innovations. My questions to you um, would be, in your opinion, do you think that the strategic use of innovations, new technology, in our era of, of global inter interconnect interconnectedness, will lead to a more stable uh, economic order, or on the other hand, can lead to a disorder of the global economic system? Thank you. Very, very good question. So is the technological progress going to lead to more stability uh, or more instability? And, and you, would argue, you might also ask within countries, not just international. Anybody else have a question? I see no other questions. Okay, in that case, who would like to answer that question? Do you think that technology, the pace of technological change, and, and particularly artificial intelligence now, is this going to make international economic relationships work better or, or more unstable? Anyone have a view on that? I've tried to ask a chat GPT, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> we could ask chat GPT for the answer, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it's a tough question, and it can go I I either way, really. Um, you know, as I said, you know, in principle, having more data, you know, more fine-tuning of, of models can help uh, educate all of us and, and hopefully come up with mutual decisions and, and that go in the right direction, and, and that creates sort of win-win situations at the end. But, but, you know, technology can also create some new gaps uh, between countries. On balance, on balance, yeah. That, that was a very chat GPT answer though, right? Because you're saying it can be this, can be that. What <coughs> Mark said, are you feeling positive about this or you think I'm more worried than I am I, feeling good I, about I'm, it? I am an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm too. 
Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I, th I think we do have the example of the Arab Spring, how much internet and um, technology play come into play. So the end of the process is another story. Uh, but if you come back to Africa, definitely um, it has uh, raised the level of consciousness, um, more participation of young people and, and women, and, and that's a good thing because I'm a, I mean, I'm a pro, I'm a pro disorder type of <laughs> activist. I mean, a, a disorder that would lead to a better order. <laughs> so uh, for that sense, um, in that sense, I think it's a good thing that people get more aware of the, of, of the issues, of the scandal, um, that's one thing. Um, so it, it, it forces government even to be more accountable on the issue they deal with, and, and I think it, it, it's very good, because to get to a new order, you need some disorder, and maybe you know, technology is going to play a role. Of course, there is a downsize of it, we do know that, a message of hatred, um, and, and things like that, that we know, but globally, I think it, it, it's a good thing. It, it, it's a tool that gets citizens to participate more, especially in an environment where they don't have much access politically or economically. So it gave uh, more eco uh, to the voices of those who you know, are left over you know, on the side of the road. Thank you very much. Good. Bit of disorder. Uh, come in, please. Yes, I would like to address the question raised from the floor with regard to technology development. I think it's good or not. Uh, it can be good or bad, but I think they change the priorities. My experience in negotiating Korea US FTA, 2007, 2006, at the time, with regard to telecommunication, most important issue was how to liberalize facility-based telecommunication services. But after that, with the uh, OTT service in place, facility-based telecommunication service is not so important. Value-added services are more important. No one talk about, no one talk about facility-based telecommunication services anymore, OTT. At the time, we did not know what is the OTT, and at the time, the OTT doesn't enter into force. So we resisted the U.S. request to liberalize tel the facility-based telecommunication services, but we fully liberalized value-added telecommunication services. And OTT, like Netflix, is come over to the world through facility-based telecommunication services. So the development of technology can change the priorities in international trade agenda but it can be both good or bad. Right. Thank you. Pierre? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with what uh, has been said. I, I, I personally, as an engineer, see the potentialities in technology. I think there are a lot of promises in technological progress, but it is the responsibility of human beings to give a moral dimension to technology use. And so technology is not a substitute to political will and to thinking about the moral dimension, the ethical dimension of technological change. What makes me uh, more optimistic than I, I was earlier is that there are international discussions about that dimension, especially uh, as far insofar as uh, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, is concerned. So I, I, I think that uh, technology can bring people together to discuss substantial matters and that, that's a good news, even in the current context. Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess the progress of science generally is good, that, but its implication, its uncertainty. The movie Relented Release, uh, Oppenheim, uh, disclosed uh, these fundamental contradiction. I guess that's very simple. Uh, Question, a simple answer. Thank you very much. But any thoughts on this? No, I, I just think that, of, uh, first of all, uh, technology brings chaos because uh, it uh, undermines uh, the, some old technologies, uh, some uh, established relations, uh, and some established visions. So therefore, it, every kind of technological breakthrough is connected with increasing chaos. But uh, 
the, you know, I would say the mission of innovators is to do what they are doing, to increase the chaos. And the mission of politicians and the mission of intellectual lead is just, you know, to combat this and to put in some framework, in some, uh, uh, in, uh, to put some limits to this. So this is a kind of, you know, societal change it is, as it is organized. So I definitely oppose the idea that we should regulate and uh, limit uh, the creative knowledge and, you know, the creative expression in any way. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I don't think that's a conversation that it is feasible to summarize. So what I will say, though, is that I think what's very clear from this is that I don't think that this hankering for preserving the order in which we used to live is actually a meaningful approach because every time we start talking about it, we discuss mostly the so many problems that the order that we have has created. And I don't think we yet have agreement on what is the kind of order where we're going to, where we would like to end up, let alone where we are going to end up. And I'd say there's some quite open questions about how long and how disorderly the transition process will be and whether during that transition process we can make progress on some of the common challenges where we can't afford to wait for the lack of clarity to be resolved because it will just end up creating disorder of a whole different magnitude. So I want to thank all our panelists for their insights. I want to thank you all for, for your presence. And I'd like you to join me in, in giving them a round of thanks, please.